Good morning, Sooner Baptist Church and visitors we might have with us and those who are with us online. It's good to see you this morning. I want to introduce somebody. Uh, we've had Susan out for a couple of weeks. She'll be back next week. But this morning we have Dr. Abigail Mace with us. She is the uh, chair of the piano department at Oklahoma Baptist University and uh, a former colleague that I worked with, and I'm very glad that she is here today. We want to testify and open our service with what happened in our lives. Heaven came down and glory filled our souls. Would you stand and let's call ourselves to worship this morning. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of a spirit with life from above into God's family divine, Justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me. Oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed. Rich is eternal and blessing supernal from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Please be seated want to just uh, echo what Lee started us with this morning. Thank you very much for coming and uh, worshiping with us and helping us this morning, filling in for Susan. That's, uh, we'll be looking forward to, to having her back, but so thankful for uh, people stepping in and, and helping us out as we gather here each week to worship as well. want to just say welcome to you. Thank you for coming this morning. If you're a guest of ours, we have those red cards that are in the chair back in front of you. If you would be kind enough just to grab one of those, briefly fill that out, you can leave that in the chair itself, or you can put it in the offering box in the, in the back, and we will uh, collect that and get that information. We would really, really appreciate that as a, as a simple way for us to connect with you. Uh, for everyone, though, that same card on the other side has a, a prayer request, little form right there. You can fill that out and turn that into the office as well, and we would be uh, happy to receive that from you, too. It's good to be here today. Good to see you here with us. I know we have uh, folks continuing to join us online, and thank you as well for, uh, for joining all of you this morning. Let me just lead us in prayer as we begin our time today. Father, thank you uh, for this hour that we can gather and worship you. 
Uh, Lord, I thank you for the ability that we have to, to gather here in this room, to gather as your people, and to call on your name. Lord, as well, I thank you for those who, who join us virtually in a way that we couldn't have done in the not-so-distant past. And, and Lord, though, um, the ideal, it would be for everyone to always be able to be here. We know that's not the case. And so, Lord, we thank you for these uh, little gifts and little abilities that, that we've been privileged with. And so, Lord, we pray as well for uh, those who join us virtually today. Your, your blessing, Lord, your, uh, just your spirit to touch in a way that only you can do. Thank you so much for this time. Lord, guide us in it, we pray. May this hour be acceptable in your sight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, like many chapters in the New Testament, reminds us why we are here today. Paul talking to the Ephesians, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he loved and he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses we are saved by grace. That's why we worship. Would you stand in response to what Jesus has done? That's why we worship. He came to live, live again in us. He came to be the living word our life. He came to die so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise to show his power and might. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Because he gave his everything. Because he gave To live, live again in us. He came to be our conquering king and friend. He came to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go, prepare a place for us. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Because he gave him everything. Because he gave his everything. Oh, that's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Because he gave his everything. Because he gave his everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 oh why we offer him our everything that's why we 
Cause he gave his everything. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Cause he gave his Cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. The splendor of the king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in life, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great! Is our God? All will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age, He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning at the end beginning and the end. The God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. His is the name above all names. Name above all names. Worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. Oh, you're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Thank you. Please be seated. want to continue our reading from last week from Ephesians chapter 4. So let me ask you to go ahead and get those Bibles in front of you. And we're going to read from Ephesians 4. I'll, I'll just pick up kind of where we left off there with verse 7 is where I'll begin reading this morning. Ephesians 4, 7. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gifts. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners into captivity. He gave gifts to his people. But what does he ascended mean 
except that He descended to the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that He might fill all things. And He personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, Christ. From Him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, we come again and we thank You that You sent Your Son to come to us and to bring salvation to us. And Lord, with that salvation, that in the gift of Your grace that You have given each one of Your children gifts with which to serve You and to build up the body of Christ. And so Lord, we say thank You for the wonderful gifts that You have given us by which we can serve You. And so Lord, we pray this morning that we as a congregation, that we individually and then collectively would be using the gifts that we have given for Your glory and for Your namesake. That the body would be built up. Lord, may it be that our attention is so on You and honoring You and living for You and and serving in light of the grace that we have received. That Lord, we would be about this business that You have called us to. That we would be faithful, Lord, to the tasks that You lay in front of us. And that we would serve You, God, faithfully for Your glory and for Your name's sake. Knowing that in doing these things, that we serve not just for ourselves, we serve for You and that, Lord, our service is to build up the body. That we would grow in maturity and fullness and trust in the Lord Jesus. So Father, I pray for for this congregation this morning, Lord, that we would continue to grow and mature in our faith in the Lord Jesus. That we would grow in unity of spirit. That our desire would be collectively for Your glory. And that we would be about Your name and about the good of Your people. Thank You so much for the ways that You have blessed us. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. We want to continue to adore and to worship and to praise the one whose name we hold above all names, our Lord Jesus. Let's stand together and sing, Glorious is Thy Name, O Lord. Blessed Savior, we adore Thee, we Thy love and grace proclaim. Thou art mighty, Thou art holy, glorious is Thy matchless name. Glorious, glorious, glorious is Thy name. O Lord, glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord. From the throne of heaven's glory to the cross of sin and shame, Thou didst come to die a ransom, guilty sinners to reclaim. Glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord. Glorious, glorious. 
Jesus is thy name, O Lord. Come, O oh, come, immortal Savior, come and take thy royal throne. Come and reign and reign forever. Be the kingdom of thy own. Glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord. Glorious, glorious, glorious. Ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him O lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him, O Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him. Would you pray with me just for a moment? Lord Jesus, we want to, as best we know how, crown you as our king. Crown you, Lord, by our decisions and by the way we take the scripture that is going to be preached to us and taught to us, and we change our, we let it change our lives, and we let your spirit work among us. You are Lord. We praise you. We adore you. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, that we praise and we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. You go ahead and grab those Bibles once again and, and turn with me to uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 7 this morning. thinking as we were, well really, I mean it's applicable across the board as we've been singing this morning, but just just in those last couple of songs in particular, I was thinking, you know, just we're, we're here to make much of Jesus. Uh, we're, we're here to exalt our God, to give Him praise, and to bring Him honor. And I know I don't tell you that and you go, oh wow, that's what we're doing. Uh, I know we know that, but I I just I think about that, and I think as we turn to the Scripture, and as we look at this passage of Scripture that we're in, and really everything that we've been working through, um, but today, today is no different, maybe even more so. We're, uh, we're not into 
shallow things. We're not into the simple as we deal with some of the things that we jump in here and begin to deal with here in the book of Hebrews. And so um, I, I say that uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this with you. And to be able to jump into passages like this, though they're not simple, last week wasn't simple, uh, but to jump in and for the Lord to teach us through His Word. And so uh, chapter 7 is where we're at this morning. And, and let me just begin our time uh, reading these verses and then kind of we'll, we'll go from there and, and talking about them. So chapter 7, verse 1, our text for today. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the king, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, remains a priest forever. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi who received the priestly office have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people. That is from their brothers, though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collects tenths from Abraham and bless the one who has the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In this one case, man who will die receives tenths. Men who will die receives tenths. But in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, who receives tenths, has paid tenths through Abraham, for he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, <laughs> that's a chunk, or that's the chunk that we're going to kind of work on a little bit this morning. But let me um, kind of back you up in your minds into chapter 4 and then rolling into chapter 5. He has already, the author of Hebrews, has already introduced talking about the priesthood right and so everything about what we're doing jesus is greater and we'll at the end of this get to exactly what he means and what what we mean today by jesus is greater in in regard to our text today but he's already presented the priesthood he's already kind of thrown that out there even the name melchizedek has come up and i uh, i believe we were still back over in the gym when that came up the first time and i said here it is here's his name but we'll come back to that later on and so uh, here we are later on and we're coming back to that and kind of starting to work through it. And so he begins to get in these things. And then if you remember in chapter 5 and then into chapter 6, what does he do? It's like he pushes pause and he says, y'all aren't ready for the meat and potatoes yet. You're still, you're still infants. You still need the milk. And so he pauses and he deals with these things. And he gives that very, very strong warning that we were in last week in chapter 6. And then it is though he comes back here in chapter 7 and picks up again where he was at about a chapter before. And so uh, it's not a new subject that he's brought up. And even Melchizedek's name has come up again but, uh, you know, more than once already, chapter 6 and then back into chapter 5. And so um, it's not a new name. It's not a new thing. It's a continuation of ideas that started back in the previous chapter and then the chapter before that as well. So... The question then is going to be to start off with, who is Melchizedek? What do we know biblically about Melchizedek? And, and in Hebrews, we have basically repeated for us everything that we know about Melchizedek. Now, um, if, you, if you have your Bibles, which many of you do there, you can go ahead and turn. If you want to mark later on, you can look. But Genesis chapter 14 that's the passage where we have the historical account of what goes on with Melchizedek. And that's it. I mean, that's the story that he's telling. So go ahead and turn there if you want to and look at it with me. I'll begin reading in verse 17. And, and just so you have in front of you and know that I won't spend a lot of time particularly focused on this account because a lot of it's going to overlap with what we see in Hebrews. But this is it. Uh, 
Chapter 14 of Genesis, verse 17, after Abram was re re returned from defeating the Keterloamer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and I give praise God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So the basic of that story, and we'll pick back up here, the basic of that story is there is a coalition of kings who are warring. Abram's nephew, Lot, gets captured in this warring that's taking place. And so Abraham forms this band, and he goes and he recovers Lot. He brings back Lot. And in, in the doing, as he is traveling on, the king of Sodom, uh, Sodom, Sodom, excuse me, after the victory, the king of Sodom comes out to meet him. But it's not just the king of Sodom. There is another figure that comes on the scene there, and that is this guy named Melchizedek. And so you take Genesis 14 and then what we have in Hebrews, and they're telling us the same thing. I'll stick with kind of the Hebrews passage here. But notice, again, this stuff about Melchizedek. Who is he? Well, let's look at how he's described here. He is a priest of God Most High. He is a legitimate, he's a real priest of God. Now, what does a priest do? Well, a priest offers sacrifices for themselves, offers sacrifices for the people and for their sins unto God. The priest serves in the temple. The, the priest represents the people before God and, and in a way serves as the go-between. Priest, and, and we got into this with Jesus already in Hebrews, Priests were of the people, they were one of the people that they could relate to, they could be sympathetic to the plight of the regular people because they had the same issues and challenges and struggles. And so uh, well, we're told here that Melchizedek was a priest. Now before I push on with that at all, in our terminology, in our day-to-day -day verbiage, if, you've, if you're, um, especially if you're in some type of Protestant, evangelical, free church kind of tradition, we don't, we don't think in terms of priests at all, do we? Jesus is the great high priest. We think in terms of that. We talk about the priesthood of believers, biblically. We don't think in terms of an individual that we would go to. There are still some um, uh, religions and groups that do those kinds of things from various different types of uh, faiths. But think now, particularly back to this group of people. He's writing to Hebrew people. They were Jewish in background. And he's talking about the supremacy of Christ, how Christ is greater and overall. And he's the fulfillment of all of these things. A huge question that would come up would be about this whole temple sacrificial system, the ministry that the priests did day in and day out. The priests were butchers. The priests were covered in blood. Why is that? Continually having to offer sacrifice. Now, you have that once a year, Day of Atonement, that ultimate thing that takes place, yes. But to the Hebrew mind, this would have been a real issue that had to be dealt with. They think in terms of the priesthood that they knew and were familiar with. And here in Hebrews, we have brought up this priest, Melchizedek. And we're told that he's a priest of God Most High. Now, I want you to think about this. This is before... Well, you've got the, the first patriarch, the first founding father of Israel, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You've got Abraham in the story. But it's before Israel is formed as a nation. It's before the 12 tribes exist. It's before they've uh, captured and taken in the promised land and are now a part of Jerusalem. Before all of those things, there was a priest to God Most High. Before the Levitical priesthood, outside of, separate from the Levitical priesthood. Now again, I know those aren't things that necessarily in our thinking register the same way because we don't, they're not a part of our day-to-day -day life. But this would have been massive to the people that he was speaking to originally. But we're told he's a priest of God Most High. Now, the priest that we know of biblically, what tribe were they from? From the tribe of Levi, right? They're called Levitical. Um, another, if you get into the high priest, those were direct descendants of Aaron in particular. 
but it's from the tribe. When you think 12 tribes of Israel, it's from the tribe of Levi. And you tuck that away in your brain because that's important as we work through this passage of Scripture. But they were from the tribe of Levi. That was the priestly tribe. Now, that was the one that, that these uh, servants of his in that old covenant were going to come from. Now think for just a moment. Does Jesus fit that? What tribe was Jesus from? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. When you talk about earthly, when you talk about the Messiah who comes in the flesh, he is from that tribe, the, the one from whom the king comes, right? So before all of this has taken place, there is a priesthood other than Levi. There's a priesthood that's separate from the, Levit the Levitical priests. And it's a priesthood that's not just based on physical descent. You understand that's the way it went in those priesthoods. It wasn't, man, they're a great guy, let's choose him. Man, God has called him. No, it was, okay, you're in the family, you're in the tree. You're... That's how they determined who these priests were going to be. But there's a different priest we see in Melchizedek. So he's a priest of God Most High. He's called King of Salem. It's believed that Salem is the ancient city of Jerusalem. And, and before Joshua ever leads the people into the promised land, God had a priest in the land. And we see not only is he a priest, but he is king. He is king of Salem. Now in the old economy, in the Old Testament, you see the priests and you see the kings. And then you see in Melchizedek, who's, who's outside of that, that covenant, you see one who is priest and king. And he breaks down the words for us here, Melchizedek. I mean, the word in Hebrew actually means, and he tells us that, right? King of righteousness. He is also king of Salem, king of Shalom, the king of peace. And there's one other thing that we see as we read through this early description of Melchizedek. Verse 3, he is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. Now, This is the, the, the basic of the picture that we see being painted here with Melchizedek. He's a priest. He's a king. He's outside of that old covenant. He's outside of that old economy. And the picture that's painted in, in the scriptures here is uh, in, the, in the record of scripture, he doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. There is no mother. There is no father. Now, now, don't take that to mean he's not a real person because he is presented as a real person. The Old Testament just doesn't speak to his genealogy or to his mom or to his dad. It, it's not a part of the record of Scripture. But Melchizedek was a regular or, or, a, or a human. He was a person. But all of this points us, and I want to take you back there to that last line in verse 3. He resembled the Son of God. He resembled the Son of God. Now, there's a lot of speculation, and you can go look all of that up if you would like about Melchizedek as a person. There's a lot of mystery because of the way he's presented in the Bible, and understandably so. There's people that, that thought he was a uh, might have been a pre-incarnate uh, picture of a person of Christ there, but before the incarnation that, that God appears to them, uh, a theophany, a Christophany, so to speak. There's people that believe he was some angel that came in human form. There's people that ascribe to the idea, certainly back in this time, about uh, a messianic figure. I want to take you back and, go that he, and just remind you that he resembles the Son of God. doesn't say that he is. I, I would point you in this direction this morning. He is what we call a type of Christ. A type of Christ. Now, when I say type, I don't mean he's, he's another one of Christ. I, I, um, we use the word, uh, a Camaro is a type of car. I mean, we, we mean there's all kinds of cars, and a Camaro is one of them. I say a German shepherd is a type of dog. Well, there's dogs, and I mean well, a shepherd fits into this category. But we, we, when I use the word type of Christ, in, in the Bible kind of study, there's this, it's called typology. And so there's these figures all throughout the Old Testament that... Uh, their life or a, a portion of what they do points to what will be fulfilled fully in Jesus. Think about Moses, for example. 
Moses has many ups and downs in his life. And you wouldn't go all of Moses' life is a, is a picture, is a type of Christ. But you would say that what he does in regard to the Exodus is, or people would say that. That, that Moses is called up and he's raised up and he goes and he delivers the people out of bondage. That's a, that paints a picture of what Jesus does in fullness in reality. And so there's typology that we see in, um, all throughout the Scriptures or throughout the Old Testament. And Melchizedek fits into this of what we see going on. Melchizedek is a type in this way. All of it is fulfilled in Jesus he is this picture of a king and of a priest who doesn't just fit in that system. He is a king and he is a priest who is superior to all of this stuff. And Jesus and his priestly ministry falls into this picture. He is a fulfillment of this picture. Now, I want to stop here for just a moment. There's a whole lot of things I kind of throw at you. There's a lot of information you can get into with a passage like this. But I want you to notice two, I think, points um, that are important for us when we come to a studying a passage like this. Um, and it's by no means am I saying this is the only couple things we could grab hold of. But one I want you to see is the providence of God. When you use the word providence, we're talking about God's I I invisible hand guiding the events of history. Like, He's accomplishing His purposes. I want you to think about that. Before Israel... Before Isaac, before Jacob, before the 12 tribes that come from that, before the going down into Egypt, before the being delivered out, before the going into the promised land, before the rebellion ever took place and the hardening of heart that would take place with Israel, there was a priest king in the land who was meant to point to Jesus. Before all of these things had happened, and what is my point in all of that? God isn't reactionary. You've had situations in your life, or you can think, you can think big picture and think about um, uh, military conquest and those kind of things, but, but you can have things that come upon you by surprise. And you find yourself reeling and going, how am I going to respond? What's the proper response to what has been done to me? How will I deal with this situation? And we react because we didn't see it coming and we were blindsided. My point in re referring to God and his providence here, God is not reactionary. God wasn't surprised when any of those patriarchs, when any of those founding fathers of Israel did what they did, he wasn't surprised with the drama that transpired that led the people uh, down into Egypt and then the way God was going to deliver them out. God wasn't surprised when the people hardened their hearts and, and rejected and turned away. He wasn't surprised when Judas uh, sold out Christ for 30 pieces of silver. It wasn't a reactionary thing. What we can't wrap our minds around and understandably so, uh, we can't wrap our minds around the fact that God has a plan. That God is accomplishing His purposes. And though we are walking kind of in a linear fashion through history, we're moving forward, God is not bound to that in the same way that we are. And He is eternal. And He sees and He knows and His divine ends are going to come about. Why do I say all that? It's not some sort of fatalism. It's not some sort of what we do doesn't matter. We see very clearly throughout Scripture commands to, to do things, to obey, to believe, to trust, to serve. My point in getting to this is really for, for us to take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all. Remember last week, we kind of that, that little phrase in there in the, in the text in chapter 6, Lord willing or as the Lord wills, that we would really live our lives with the understanding that God is in charge. Our job is to walk faithful to Him. Our job is to obey Him. We can't control how everything falls out. and We may think we understand what's coming. We may or we may not. Our job is to be obedient to Him. 
And it's not as though we're talking about a big God who is out there and who doesn't care. This is the God who loves his people. And so in this, we see the providence of God through all of this. But the other kind of point that I would point you to this morning, point I would point you to, is the sufficiency of Scripture. Genesis was penned hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before this passage in Hebrews. And way, 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 way before Psalm 110, which we'll get to in a minute, which also references Melchizedek. And God, in his spirit-inspired way of giving us the scriptures, has this little picture of this individual named Melchizedek who just appears on the scene and who is no more heard from. and yet serves to point us to Jesus. The author here of Hebrews, also inspired by God, he looks back and he sees and and understands what God is doing. and He's opening our eyes to help us see it as well. And so um, it's amazing to think about these kinds of things. Those small passages, even the wording of the passage, points us to particular truths here that we're studying today in this part of the world. What an amazing thing. Just a reminder of God's good word to us. What a reminder of the importance to us to grow in the knowledge of it. You may be an expert in some field of study. That may be wonderful. We need experts in fields of study all across the the gamut of things. But what we need to know about in particular is what God reveals to us in the Scripture. What we need to be driving us is what God reveals in the Scripture. And so, as we think about the sufficiency of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, we use these words. I'm not encouraging you this morning to just um, mentally check off a doctrine that you would hold in your head. Yes, I believe the Bible. Yes, the Bible's true. Yes, that's great that we would say that. But I think beyond that it is, okay, do I know it? Am I growing in it? Do I seek to obey the truth that's been revealed to me in the Scripture? So Melchizedek, we go back to our story here. Melchizedek does a couple of things. He's he's been introduced and we note a couple of things that he does. Um, One, he brings out the bread and the wine. Now, uh, this may just be a fellowship meal of sorts that is to come. Uh, We see see no mention in in the book of Hebrews or any other thing that would point us any other direction. Though it's hard not to read this passage and to see that and to think about Christ and not go to the body and the blood and the supper and all of those things that come forward. And and I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying uh, it seems like an opportune time for him to go there Uh, But he doesn't. He doesn't point us that direction. But uh, one way or another, Melchizedek brings out the bread and the wine, and then he blesses Abraham. Well, why is that important? Well, when you get down into 6 and into 7, what you see is the greater, the greater person, the greater one, is going to bless the lesser. So Melchizedek is the greater, and he is blessing Abraham, who is the lesser. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment but think about that really really quickly founding father of israel the 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 father of the faith and he is lower than and he pays homage to in a sense not directly to melchizedek but he gives the 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 tithes the tents to him it says something for sure which again we'll circle back to in just a moment so uh, melchizedek uh, he comes out to meet him he gives, brings the bread and the wine. He blesses Abraham. And then notice the response from Abraham. What does he do? He gives him a tenth. He, he pays him a tithe, if you want to use that language. Now, when you hear about giving a tenth, what is it that you think of? Well, I'll just use the word. We, and your translation may use the word as well. We think about that principle, that instruction, not just principle, the, the command we find in the Old Testament for, for God's covenant people on how giving was to take place. It was the way God in His economy provided for the priests, 
And then he provided for other things as well with all of the tithes that were included. Uh, the tithe that they gave when it was all said and done could be much, much greater than just a tenth when you included all of the tithes that they were about. Now, there are certainly people who have a different understandings of that today regarding the tithe in relation to the covenants and all of that. I will just simply point out, because we're not going to go down the rabbit hole today, we are to be people who give. If anything, under grace, we are to be people who are generous. And the tithe is a, is a good principle. It's, it, obviously, it's a good principle. It comes from God. Um, but if we are going to give solely in light of grace, it's hard to see how that would be less than giving in a way that we see instructed for them in Old Testament Israel. But you will notice here, in this particular case, this is before the law. This is before the covenants. This is before all of that. We don't see a continual thing, but we do see a tithe that takes place before all of those things that we just mentioned were set into motion. Now, I want to just take a few minutes today and I want to read these last few verses. I want to close up our time by kind of drawing it all together because it's, it's a decent amount of facts. It's a decent amount of knowledge about Melchizedek and who he was and what he did. But the why matters. So uh, read with me again. We'll read these verses. Verse 4 and following says, Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi who received the priestly office have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is from their brothers, though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected tenths from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, men who will die, that's the Lev Levites, right? Men who will die receive tenths, but in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, who received tents, has paid tents through Abraham, for he was still within the ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, that's a lot of words. <laughs> that's several verses. But I'm going to just kind of, kind of walk through a bit of the argument, just in my own kind of wording, pretty quickly to kind of to drive to where we're at before we close today. So, you have the Levites. That's what we call the priestly tribe, right? And within Levi is the tribe. Is, within Levi are the, the descendants of Aaron who would be the high priest. But um, the Levitical priesthood, Levi, right? So you have the Levites. They descend from Abraham. Abraham has Isaac, has Jacob. Jacob's name has changed to Israel. Jacob, or Israel has his 12 sons. And, and essentially from that becomes the 12 tribes of Israel one of those being Levi, okay? So from Abraham comes Levi as one of his descendants. And these Levitical priests collect tithes, and they collect these tithes from their own brothers, from their own countrymen. That's what they were instructed to do. Melchizedek collected tithes from Abraham and blessed Abraham. Because the Levites descend from Abraham, right? You have Abraham, the Levites descend from him, in a sense, they pay, through Abraham, they also pay tithes to Melchizedek. That's part of what he's saying here. So in Abraham, basically, these Levites essentially also pay tithes to Melchizedek. They're represented by Abraham paying those tithes to Melchizedek. Now, again, the one who uh, blesses is greater than the one being blessed. The one who received in this case was greater than the one who was giving the tenth. All of that to say, you may be just get to the point. Well, <laughs> we're getting there. Melchizedek, if you haven't got the picture yet, is greater than Abraham. Right? So we, we've established that. Melchizedek, priest and king, is greater than Abraham. Therefore, Melchizedek and his priesthood is greater than the priesthood that comes from Abraham. Levi comes from Abraham. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, so Melchizedek and his priesthood is greater than Abraham, his descendant Levi, and the priesthood that comes from Levi. All right. With that being said, Jesus 
is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus' priesthood is greater than the Levitical priesthood. All that these Hebrew people had been familiar with, all the sacrifices, all the covering that was done that was never going to last, all of the, the, the ceremony, all of the ritual, and even a good priest that they may have, if they had a good priest at the time, or they, they knew a good one, whatever great priest they may have had, he was inferior to the priesthood that Jesus had. Now, there's a lot more to that. And there's more that comes on the heels as we get further on into chapter 7. But his priesthood is greater. His ministry is greater. <laughs> Where he serves is superior. His covenant is greater. All, all of this is to point these people who, for whatever reason, were struggling to understand that Jesus is greater. He is the great high priest. Not just in the comparative, not just greater. He is uh, superlative. He is the best. He is the greatest of all. And so all of this is to point to that reality, that understanding. Later in chapter 7, and we'll come back here tonight, but in verse 26 and following it says, this is the kind of high priest we need. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do. First for their own sins and then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who were weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. Jesus is the greatest of all. Jesus is the great high priest. Jesus is the one who goes before God. And yes, offered, we, there's a get into a lot here, but he, he offered himself for us. He made the sacrifice for us. He intercedes for us. We have so much in Christ and in Christ alone. Our hope is in Jesus and in no one else. Now this morning, I seriously doubt that there's anyone in this room, now I could be wrong, but I seriously doubt there's anyone in this room who walked in here today struggling with their faith in relation to the, the priesthood properly. And thinking in terms of the Old Testament economy and the New Testament economy and all of those things. But the facts don't change. Let me, let me just draw our attention as I wrap this up. Jesus is the great high priest. Jesus is the one who made the sacrifice, the payment for our sin that no one else could make to, a, to a, atone for our sin in the way that he did. Jesus is the one who goes into the presence of the Father on our behalf. It's because we are in Jesus that we can be made right with God. It's because we are in Christ and His ministry for us that we are secure. You want to talk about the security of the believer? It's because of the work of Christ. Yes, on the cross, but He is there for us all the time. What a wonderful thing we have in Christ. And so what I would just point you to this morning is there, there is legitimately no other way. I just want to draw, uh, point you to Christ once more. I hope it's obvious as we're sitting here this morning in this, in this place that Christ is greater than the things of this world. That Christ is greater than our own priorities and our money and, and our ease and our comfort and, and whatever else it may be. But maybe, it's, maybe we're struggling in reality. That's, I don't know where we're at. But I just want to point you to Jesus. He is our hope. We're going to sing in just a minute a song. I didn't even realize we were doing this. Last Sunday night when I was wrapping up, I was just reading for you the words of before the throne of God above. As we sing again these words today, I want you to think about your standing. If you are in Christ, the firm foundation, the security you have is because of Jesus, your great high priest. Praise God for Him. Do you see here how God works these things together? How God is accomplishing His purposes? Do you see how God's plan unfolds 
through all of this and how this beautifully points us to Christ, who is our hope, who is our shield, who is our security. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you this morning that you are so gracious to us in so many ways, but, but even to allow us to see in these passages of Scripture as we just uh, scratch the surface at understanding and unpacking how you, your plan of salvation was before the foundation of the world and it is unfolding. Lord, may our trust in you only grow. May our surrender to you only increase as we consider these things. Lord, that that you're working your plan and that you are a a good and gracious God and you love your people in such an amazing way. Lord, this morning, for this congregation, I I pray for us that you, Father, in in, in the the work that your Spirit does would um, accomplish your purposes, God, as we continue in this hour of worship. That you would teach us, Lord, and not just that we would understand facts better, but that our hearts would be more attuned to you as we walk out of these doors. That we would praise you with even more depth and gratitude because we've been reminded of what you've provided for us in Jesus, our great high priest. Lord, I just pray for you to be honored in it all. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you stand with me now, we're going to sing a song together this morning.